Springs, and at the end of the talk, we'll talk about the uh, biotechnological applications, um, uh, some of the observations we're actually seeing in some of these hot springs. Before I actually get started on that, I do want to make sure to acknowledge some of the funding sources for this work I've been um, doing, uh, particularly uh, Innovate Grant helped with some of this, uh, an NSF grant, also a Elastic Space Grant, both an undergraduate and graduate fellowship. And most recently, the work that we've been doing on the International Space Station that was funded through the cases. Uh, individual people that have been working on this, I'll try to make sure to acknowledge them throughout this particular talk. <clears throat> so, Earth has a multitude of environments. We're probably more familiar with the surface environment that's conducive to human life, but there are environments that are actually outside the range of human life that can support human life. And these are considered or extreme environments. This temperature, pressure, salinity, pH typically delimit what is it, an extreme environment. But even at these very extreme, high or low values, we can have life that actually exists and even flourish in now, we typically use these to kind of delimit those extreme environments, but we can use anything else, any other type of environmental parameters, such as heavy metal concentrations, that actually can delimit what is an extreme environment. And the organisms that live in here, they're considered to be extremophiles, and they have the special adaptations and enzymes that allow them to survive in these harsh conditions. <coughs> now, there are some eukaryotes that can survive in what we would consider to be an extreme environment, but really it's the bacteria and the archaea that have the record for being able to push to these extreme conditions. And it's through the study of these that we get to learn about early life, life uh, potential on other planets, microbial processes involved in global biogeochemical cycles, and of course there's a rich source of biotechnological applications uh, just within these type of plant groups. And that's what my research really does. So we go out to these extreme environments, to the hot, to the cold, to the deep subsurface, explore the microbes, understand the ecology, the adaptations, and the metabolic potentials and functions of these microbes. And then the lessons that we've learned from these extreme environments, we start applying that in the lab to understand some biotechnological applications such as building precursor molecules, or even extracting rare earth elements. And you can use that in a variety of either low, sort, low uh, value um, uh, materials. But for today, I'm gonna kind of focus a little more on the hot springs, uh, in part because these are really a good analog for early life. The high temperatures, the low oxygen, uh, the gases that are coming from the surf surface really kind of mimic what we would expect from an early Earth. There's actually a paper that came out a couple of years ago that uh, did a pretty good job of arguing that the origin of life uh, came from these surface hot springs instead of, say, a deep subsurface hydrothermal vent. Of course, this might be one of those areas that we you know never actually uh, determined because we can't go back there. Also, hot springs are a great uh, analog for um, life on other planets, uh, such as Europa, where there is these hydrothermal vents uh, happening underneath the ice. And the ecology of these hot springs are usually a little more um, uh, simpler, so it makes it a little bit easier to actually pick out what those key interactions are. And also, because of these uh, harsh conditions, we can start to look at the adaptations, the resistance that they have to these particular stress environments. We're going to come back to this quite a bit, these novel organisms. There's a lot of these organisms in here. And we're going to talk a little bit, a bit more about that in a little bit. But also, there's a whole host of biotechnological applications. They have to have these thermal stable enzymes to be able to survive in a hot spring. 
And one of the kind of the gold standard of biotechnology is the TAC polymerase. Okay. It was comes, comes from Thermos aquaticus, which was found in uh, Yellowstone Hot Spring. And without this TAC polymerase, we wouldn't have PCR, we wouldn't have DNA sequencing, we wouldn't have a lot of the modern, modern forensics that we have today. And so this is the one kind of biotechnology that's really revolutionized. It's even built entire fields in biology of what we can actually do. Now all hot springs, of course they're hot, that's why they're called hot springs. Right? Um, but there can be a large range of physicochemical conditions. And it's dependent on really the geology of how far that water has to interact with the host rock, the types of that host rock, as well as the heat source, if it's volcanic or non-volcanic. And all of that can really change the ions <coughs> Um, and the physical chemical conditions, which is going to affect the overall microbial communities and how they actually uh, interact with each other uh, and with the environment. The hot springs are found worldwide. Um, they've been studied uh, mostly in Yellowstone. Uh, but So we went over to a place over in uh, China, right over here. This is India, uh, the Himalaya Mountains, Tibetan Plateau. It's with in here being pushed up, we get these folds over here with a lot of geothermal fields coming through. There's over 140 geothermal fields. There's two particular areas that we've been studying. Uh, the first one is uh, Ruhai, we're going to go into. <coughs> this is actually considered a kind of like a national park. You can pay to go in. Uh, there's a nice little path to walk around. We're going to go up to the top. This is actually a mountain, kind of. And uh, one of the first sites is Iran Chu. It's a very acidic, pH about 2.5, with small little pots here and there. Uh, and those pots range in temperature from 50 to about 80 degrees Celsius. Right next to it is Dong Dong Go. This is the main pot that they go to. You actually can cook your own eggs and um, peanuts in there. I'll sell those for you. Imagine, but delicious. Uh, just never mind the arsenic. Uh, if you go down the uh, hill here, I'm not showing all the stairs you have to go down and up. Uh, this is ZZ Kwan. Uh, it's a pH of about 4.5. The only way you can get that is by a mixing of two different uh, fluids that come together. Just over there is uh, drum beating. Uh, this is a high flow, uh, very high temperature, about 85 degrees Celsius, uh, about certain neutral pH. Next to that is this uh, pregnancy well. There's actually two of them there. There's one for males, one for females. There is uh, encouraged to drink from it. Still, there's a horse in it. Um, and uh, if you drink it, you're supposed to get pregnant. I don't know how the male one works. <laughs> uh, and then all the way down is the Sierra Boza, uh, which has these brilliant white streamers. We'll talk a little more about those. Uh, but that's a little more of a colder temperature. Go over to Tientin, which is a natural village. Um, there's a couple different springs in here, but this is the, one of the main uh, springs that uh, basically all the locals use that for all their cooking and their cleaning. Um, so there's a little ledge right here. They'll come up, and there's actually a bucket. They'll come down, grab that, uh, and up there. This is actually in a hotel, so I'm looking out on the balcony from my hotel room, uh, taking this picture. Uh, and that water is piped into the hotel, so you can uh, take a bath with the hot spring water. <coughs> Not a bad place to study. So one of the first things that we did uh, when we first went out there in uh, January <coughs> 2011 is we collected um, basically all the samples that we possibly could. Water, sediment, uh, over 45 different types of sprays and samples, ranged from a pH of 2.5 to about 9.4. And a range of temperatures from 50 to 96 or 93 degrees Celsius to really start to get an idea of the microbiology. What was there uh, was one of the first questions that we came up with. And uh, what we found is that there's two main dominant types of microbes. There's the Ophicales, which is a bacteria. Uh, and this is actually one of those, the um, White streamers, they actually produce those white streamers. It's actually almost dominant of one particular Ophicales. They are the primary producers. They don't do photosynthesis. They do reverse TCA cycle to be able to fix carbon. 
And they're one of the few that can actually do uh, reverse TCA in these hot furnace. There's also Quinarchiota, which is in the archaeal domain. And most of these are thermophiles. Um, we don't know a whole lot about these. We don't have a whole lot of cultured representatives. Uh, so most of the stuff that we get from this is uh, from just genomic data. So we knew who was there. And then the next question was, well, what happens over time? We expect, when we first went out there, we expected that the microbial community isn't going to change, especially with the seasons. Because most of this water is deeply sourced, why would it be dependent upon how the Earth is rotating around the sun, unlike, say, a lake or something like that? Well, um, so we went back out in uh, June, and uh, this here is a comparable correspondence analysis. Uh, basically what it does is it's a um, non-metric uh, uh, way of uh, depicting the different types of taxa that are there. So here, it circled everything that was found here was only found in January. Everything here was only found in June. Everything in the middle is found during both times. But if it's closer to over here, it's found more in January and over here, it's more in June. So quickly, we notice that most of the archaea were found over here in January. And all of the bacteria, some of the bacteria, were found in uh, June. Also, June had a lot higher diversity. And so when we started looking at the types of microbes in there, um, June, we started seeing that there were some of these microbes that would be more associated with soil or mammalian, fecal contamination. So we started wondering, well, are these truly contaminants? Um, so we went back and we did analysis and made sure that uh, it wasn't actually a contaminant that was coming from us. And then, um, Sort of ask, well, where are these coming from if they are truly being in there? Uh, and if they are thermophiles, why are we classifying them as a soil microbe or something that you find in the gut? <coughs> well, there's a lot of different ways that microbes can get in these. Okay? It could be a well timed bird that just flies over the top. Right? These hot springs, they are open to the air. They're not going to be completely independent from that uh, spring. So as that bird's flying over, you know, it could just be a well-timed bird. Or it could just be rain. In June, it's actually the monsoon season. And so we have a lot of rain coming in and actually washing into these particular springs. So we wanted to look a little bit closer at this. It's like, okay, well, is it really the rain? Now, a lot of the springs that we did this with, we didn't see that, but they had a high flow rate. So like the Guming Chen, the drum beating one, um, it didn't really, we didn't see any type of uh, changes over time with that. But if we went to that Deer Enchu, the one that was at the top with a very high pH, or excuse me, very low pH, pH 2.5, um, and there was one particular spring that was underneath the cliff, and water would just cascade over the top of it when it was raining really hard. Well, we went through and uh, collected the soil samples. And this here is a non-metric multiple initial scaling, kind of like the CCA, but it's not constrained. And uh, the microbial community from the soil was over here. We get some of these more of the proteobacteria, actinos and acidobacteria that uh, we would typically consider to be in a soil microbe. Okay. During the low rain, that particular pot was about 69 degrees. And it was still kind of dominated by our two friends, the Achilles and the Pernarchiota. Well, there was one day that was raining pretty hard. And so instead of staying in my hotel room, I went out and collected a couple more samples uh, throughout that day. And notice that the temperature decreased quite a bit. pH didn't change. Uh, still stayed about 2.5. And we started getting more of the proteobacteria. Actually, the same proteobacteria we saw that. So it was showing that the rain was actually depositing these microbes in there. Within 24 hours of that rain stopping, the microbe community came right back to what it looked like over here. <clears throat> but this still kind of begs the question is, what is a thermophile? The ones that are coming into this environment, 
how long are they surviving? We would expect that DNA in these particular environments that are hot environments, that DNA would degrade very quickly and that the other organisms would actually probably use and eat those other organisms. Oops. So we actually had a really nice system to start to type, to break out the types of microbes, if they're a thermophile or a mesophile, without being able to, because most of these we can't actually grow in the lab. And this was that uh, spring over in Dienten. And actually on this wall right here, this hot uh, spring water would actually flow over the top and down here, and it would create this nice little mat. Which made it really nice because we had one single inoculum coming through. We had a uh, temperature uh, gradient going down. So it started off pretty hot and went down, uh, down to about um, 28 degrees near the bottom. Uh, there was actually a little hole in the wall right there. So that little area where it's black uh, is actually a little bit hotter. And uh, since we had this full wall, we could actually do kind of a high sample resolution across there. So we went through, and uh, basically where there's all these numbers, we went and sampled um, all of those particular areas. And started looking at the microbial communities. So this is another NMS. Um, again, um, we also measured uh, things, not only the temperature, but the pH, uh, cations, cations, um, uh, trace elements, everything else that we measured basically didn't change uh, across that wall. The only thing that changed was temperature, which made it really nice because then we could actually go through and actually model the optimal temperature for these organisms without actually having to take them into the lab and do grow them and determine what that optimal temperature is. So what, what I'm showing here is the temperature is the modeled optimal temperature of that particular um, taxa. And it goes from 32 up to about 46 degrees here. Well, if we take that information and we start looking at the types of interactions that actually occur within the microbial community, this here is a, uh, it's a bipartite network. Uh, again, the colors are the same as the colors in the NMS, where the low temperatures are right here, and the much higher temperatures are over here. And what we notice is at the high temperature range, we get a lot of uh, tight clustering, but not as many uh, interactions between individual organisms. Here, we don't have quite as um, many clusterings, or we have a lot of interactions, but it's not as quite as tight. It's still important a little bit. But first, there is this a break that happens right about 42 degrees. We didn't expect this. We actually expected to have more interactions at higher temperature. It's harsher, right? It's harder to survive. So maybe they have to rely on more friends more. So we expected to see more interactions. But since we're seeing tighter interactions, maybe the ones that they're not interacting with a whole lot of them, other organisms, they're just interacting with one more closely. And this, this break here, it actually kind of follows what we see in organisms when we culture them. A thermophile really isn't a thermophile unless we can grow it over about 42 degrees. There's some debate of what temperature you can really cut that off at. But this is kind of interesting because since there's very few interactions right coming through here, the, um, once you become a mesophile, if you are a mesophile, it makes it really hard to actually jump over and become, or to jump into being a thermophile, to evolve into a thermophile. Same way. A thermophile doesn't have the ability to survive in mesophile communities. And this is what we're seeing in uh, cultures as well. This is showing the same thing, um, but this is showing uh, I've collapsed all of the same temperature down, and the thickness of the line 
It's actually showing, uh, depicting the number of interactions. So a lot of interactions between here, very few interactions between each other here. Um, when I start talking about biological dark matter, that'll come in a little more important as to why that is. Just uh, uh, another line of evidence that these are truly thermophiles that we're uh, modeling through there. Um, as, uh, the, as the sampling temperature, as our optimal temperature growth increases, we do see the GC content and the 16S gene increase. This doesn't happen with all the other functional genes, probably because they don't have that uh, secondary structure. But the 16S gene has that secondary structure, and so at higher temperatures, more GC means that it can actually maintain that structure a little bit longer. And uh, when we uh, look at the GC content of our organisms, here's the range, uh, the median, at, uh, what the ones that were modeled at this low temperature, and the ones that were modeled at the higher temperatures, you see this uptake of the GC content. Keep in mind, this is just a short segment of about 300 base pairs of that 16S gene. Um, if we had the full length gene, probably would have a little bit higher resolution uh, looking at this. <clears throat> when we look at uh, the same system and look at the phyla that actually, uh, how they're distributed across that temperature range, most of the phyla, instead of looking at the individual taxa, follow that same, that full range. There's some here that are a little bit, uh, have a little narrow range than some of the others. But most of them follow that same range. So this is kind of interesting in that it suggests that thermophily actually evolves several times. You can have a thermophilic organism within a particular phyla as well as a mesophyla. So I mentioned a couple times this biological dark matter, or uh, the organisms that we have no cultured representatives from. I don't actually like biological dark matter because it has uh, astrobiological implications, but that's the term everybody's been using. Um, but it, and it's a pretty hot topic right now, is trying to determine what is out there. Because we now have the ability to sequence and actually look for these without being able to culture them. And there is a number of people out there tr still trying to get these cultures uh, available, and uh, so then we can actually uh, use them for biotechnological applications if possible. Uh, the thing with these, um, uh, the dark matter, is there's so many of them. This is a uh, phylogenetic tree um, that was uh, produced by Laura Hug back in 2000. It can be updated uh, with some of the archaea. They're just getting some of these Asgard archaea. Um, <coughs> the whole thing. Um, but uh, there's this candidate phyla radiation. The entire uh, group of this candidate phyla, the ones that we don't have any culture representatives from, that's uh, out there now. So we're finding a lot more uh, as we go out to new environments and as our sequencing gets uh, even better. And they're a very rich source of uh, novel type of enzymes that we can actually use uh, in other applications. So we actually went out uh, and trying to find some of this biological dark matter. We went out with the idea, okay, if we are actually going out and sequencing that 16S gene, which is the typical way to search for microbes and understand the phylogeny in there. We have to use primers. Primers that are going to be specific to that particular area. Well, the design of our primers is only good based off of the uh, organisms we have in that database. Well, what if we go out there and we don't uh, base this off of those primers? We have to base it off of the metagenomic study where we don't have to do this a priori knowledge of what that primer should look like. And we found this uh, candidate phyla, calling it uh, Cryptonia, because it actually um, was hidden to us and was actually quite abundant in many hot springs, not only in Yellowstone and Nevada, but in uh, uh, China as well. <coughs> and 
so uh, by finding this, we were able to basically complete the near complete genome of it and start coming up with what the nutritional requirements uh, are and how it actually survives. We found that, that it is a heterotroph, uh, but there are some uh, nutritional deficiencies in it, so we'll uh, come back to those. Um, with it being a heterotroph, this has the glycolysis and the TCA cycle, um, but it does seem to have this aromatic hydrocarbon degradation pathway. And this is actually a common theme with some of that biological dark matter is some of these more complex carbon sources, it, they are actually able to use these complex carbon sources. So kind of maybe the byproduct, what is actually left after some of the other organisms that we can actually culture. So this might have some implications of how we can actually culture more of these organisms. But the nutritional deficiencies, a lot of these fell into being able to produce amino acids. So we're like, well, if it can't produce an amino acid, it has to be able to get it from somewhere else. So we went through and did a co-correlation network, uh, same as what I was showing before, but um, found that this uh, Arbutides is actually uh, co-correlated. When you look in one environment, we uh, find Kryptonia, we usually find this Arbutides in there as well. Well, we got a genome of that as well, in our metagenome. So we started looking through at what the uh, nutritional requirements are and uh, pathways. And so here, if it's black, it means that it didn't have it. Um, if it's blue, it was synthesized by the Armitides. If it's in red, it was synthesized by uh, the Kryptonia. And so things like histidine, um, Tryptophan was actually produced by both of them. Uh, leucine was not produced by any of them. Okay. Over here, um, methionine is actually produced by Armitides. And so it's kind of showing that maybe these are actually uh, working with each other and supplying uh, uh, amino acids across from one another to the other. Of course, none of them produce leucine. There's others that were correlated with uh, this, but they're not um, was as highly correlated. So we'd have to look and see if there's any other organism that can actually help produce uh, the leucine for both of them. We also noticed that in the genome, there was this novel fusion of this CRISPR-Cas9, um, or types 1 and 3, and has actually uh, really increased the genetic diversity of what CRISPR uh, has out there, which allows us to um, actually use these for different types of uh, applications. So one of the last characteristics of these hot springs before I move over into the biotechnology uh, I want to talk about is these molybdo enzymes. These are enzymes that use molybdenum as a uh, cofactor. There's three different types of um, protein families. There's the uh, sulfate oxidase, the DMSO, dimethyl oxide, and xanthine oxidase uh, families. The proteins that are in here, they are involved in a very uh, in nitrogen, sulfur, and carbon cycles. Um, a classic example of this is nitrogenase. The nitrogenase is actually what's used to fix nitrogen, it takes uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere, fix it so then uh, organisms can actually uh, use it into ammonia. You guys can come on in. There's seeds all over. <laughs> and in the nitrogenase here, this right here, we do have that molybdenum. It also has this iron sulfur. Um, you know, nitrogen fixation is highly um, costly as far as ATP. So uh, they have to use, be able to use a lot of the less One of the reasons we were interested in this is uh, lindum in hot springs isn't really all that bioavailable. At a pH uh, about 5 and higher, uh, and depending on the temperature, it's in a glutenate form. This is good. This is where it's bioavailable. This is the transporters to be able to bring it in. It has to be in this glutenate form. As soon as we start increasing the temperature or going into lower pH, it starts forming different types of minerals and to have to uh, or even uh, more, and the lower pH, 
it actually creates more molybdenum around this um, uh, oxygen. And it makes it really hard to actually break down uh, once it gets into that um, mineral type form. So we had these uh, range of pH from really low 2.5 all the way up to about 9. And so we thought, well, if we look at these, based on this, we would see that all of these particular enzymes should be found in these higher pH temperatures or uh, pH environments. So one of the first things we did is, well, let's just run the analysis. Let's see if we can actually detect it uh, in actual uh, water. And for the most part, most of these were below our detection limit of 0.08 nanomolars. Um, we come on here, bridge spring, uh, actually had the highest of about eight. Um, that's, uh, there was some weird stuff going on with that one, but um, we'll talk about the microbial community of why that's that in a second. And then over here in Dienten, uh, the other springs there, they had some over there as well. And so uh, if it's not there, it should be in the uh, mineral form if it is uh, in the uh, mineral form, or at least at very, very low concentrations. So we went through, did a metagenomic study, searched through that the metagenome, and found that pretty much every type of um, lipno enzyme was found at every site, even at the low pH sites. Uh, and actually, the low pH site probably had some of the highest diversity. Um, it, as far as liver enzymes. So this is a little strange. That's okay. Um, it could mean that they're just there, but they're not using it. So we started looking at, well, what type of transporters are there? Uh, there's various types of transporters to be able to bring that lignum in. This mod ABC uh, was the dominant one, and it's actually probably one of the most efficient transporter systems. Some of these others, the tough, um, uh, tungsten, they actually can co-transport or uh, use um, aluminum instead of tungsten, but uh, they're not quite as efficient. So this makes sense. Um, if there is there, you're going to have to work pretty hard, so you want the most efficient enzyme to get into it. Well, let's take a look at this nitrogenase. We wanted to look at this because we had other collaborators that have been working on nitrogen fixation in these particular springs. And I'll, I'll say trying to calculate what the nitrogen fixation rate is at a hot spring has its own uh, complications. So we do know that nitrogen fixation occurs, we just don't know how fast it occurs. Um, actually getting those rates, for some reason, we have not been able to get that down. But it's occurred at all of these particular sites. Well, nitrogenases, I didn't tell you this, you don't have to use molybdenum in there. Sometimes you can substitute it for iron or even vanadium. So if the organism doesn't have a access to the molybdenum, it should transfer and switch over to either using iron or vanadium. And there's, you can look at the enzymes in the metagenome and determine if it's using the iron or the vanadium in there. So even at very low concentrations, below our detection limit, we were finding the nitrogenase, okay? And, um, of course, this one had the really high one, that's up here, and there was a lot of different types of uh, this NIF gene, which is the nitrogenase. We use that as a proxy for nitrogenase. And it has very diverse, this actually particular spring has a lot of uh, other type of cyanobacteria in it, which are known for nitrogen fixation, um, and that's why we were, we're seeing a lot of molybdenum in there as well, and a lot of nitrogen fixation occurring. We don't see as much over here, um, and it's pretty much uh, set up by these aquacales, but they were still there. And they weren't using these alternate uh, types. So what this is showing is that there must be some other mechanism you have to scavenge this environment to actually get low concentrations of molybdenum. And some other people are actually seeing this in peat bogs. Even in very low concentrations of molybdenum, 
they are able to grab that either from the mineral form or from the very, very low concentrations and still use this most efficient nitrogenase. These other ones are about 60 to 75% less efficient uh, at uh, fixing nitrogen than the molybdenum nitrogenase. So this is, will become important here when we start talking about biotechnology and micro-mineral interactions. So I'll put a little plug in. I teach microbial biotechnology. Uh, if you want to take it, it's selfish. Um, I teach it every other year. Um, this uh, last time, we'll actually talk about some of the results from the last time we talked about uh, the uh, microbial biotechnology class. And really, this is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. It affects everything from food to medicine to bioremediation and even agriculture. Um, anybody looked on the back of a, um, uh, what am I thinking? The back of a, oh my goodness. The, yeah, the food label. Oh my goodness, wow. <laughs> it's going to be a long press to talk. Uh, back of the food label. And you'll notice that uh, oftentimes they'll say niacin, okay? Niacin is a food preservative. We get all of that from bioengineered um, bacteria that actually are producing that niacin for us. Okay. What I'm going to focus on today, there are two particular projects, is isobutene production and rare earth uh, extractions. <clears throat> uh, this particular figure actually came from a uh, publication that we just thought out that was actually part of the microbial biotechnology class. Uh, the final project, they wrote up a review particle, and I know there's Sarah in here, and there's a few other, uh, Brian, yeah, um, I think those are the only ones that were here. Um, so they went through and wrote this review article of the different types of gases, alkenes, and how we can actually use genetic engineering to produce these particular alkenes. Right now, all of these alkenes ethylene, isobutene, and isoprene come from crude oil. We get it, they take it, they put it through the steam cracker, which is really hot, a lot of energy intensive, produces a lot of carbon dioxide in the process, and then they extract this ethylene, isobutene, and isoprene, and take that, ship it off to the chemical industries, which then build it up into plastics, and rubbers, and uh, antifreeze, and just about anything that everybody says comes from oil, it breaks it down to this and they build it up from this. So this is an important compound that we really need to have access to. Well, as it turns out, microbes can actually produce these compounds. Okay? I don't expect you to read all this, but everything here in green is actually an enzyme. Okay? These are the different compounds here that's uh, being produced. And there are some of these novel enzymes that we're finding from the biological dark matter in hot springs and some of the other extreme environments that can actually uh, be plugged into these particular pathways to make it a little more efficient. Yeah. What I'm going to focus in on here is this uh, isobutene production. And actually, this last step here from hydroxy isobalerate to isobutene. A classic example is using this melatonin 5 diphosphate decarboxylase. Decarboxylase. I told you it's going to be a long time. Which takes this 3 uh, hydroxy isobalerate and uh, converts it directly into isobutene. It actually has a rate of about 2.5 picomoles per minute per gram of cells, which isn't a whole lot. Well, there was a new enzyme recently found from uh, Picophilus tortoise, uh, and it actually comes from an acidic hot spring, pH of about 2, um, and it grows at about 80 degrees Celsius. And it was characterized as a melatonite 3 kinase. We don't know exactly the mechanism of how it does this, uh, but it's proposed that it takes that 3-hydroxyoxobalerate, 
okay, ATP, produces some uh, unstable intermediate, which then decomposes into isobutene. When we take that enzyme, we can't really grow up picotaurus, picotaurus very fast, so we take it out of that organism, throw it into E. coli, which is a classic uh, organism for doing this, and we get up to 507 picomoles per minute per gram of cells. Quite a bit faster than what this is found in uh, natural environments. Well, at the same time, when they published on this, they said, well, since we don't really know what this process is, we do think it's an unstable intermediate, it's possible by combining these two enzymes that we can actually increase this rate even faster by <clears throat> basically producing this intermediate and then this one might actually work on that intermediate to produce isobutene. So this is the work that James Wilson, uh, a has been working on, it is actually genetically engineering E. coli to contain both of those enzymes. And not only just putting it into a plasmid where you have to have antibiotics to make sure it stays inside that cell, we wanted to directly insert it into the chromosome. In order to do this, we used a CRISPR-Cas uh, system where we had this plasmid uh, with a uh, homology region to a particular region in this chromosome, uh, in the E. coli chromosome. And we had the other homology region. We went through and uh, synthesized this and put it on to a T7A1 promoter, which is uh, constitutive and highly expressed. Put it in with uh, the E. coli, transformed it, let it go through the conjugation. Uh, and if it actually was inserted into there, everything should work. Because in this particular region, there's what's called a PAM site. The way CRISPR works is it has to have this guide RNA, and it goes along uh, the DNA, and if it finds a particular area, uh, a PAM site that is next to where that guide RNA finds it, it will cleave that uh, genome, or the, yeah, the DNA right in half, right through here. So if it actually goes through and conjugates it, uh, and inserts it into the chromosome, then this E. coli here doesn't actually get, um, uh, won't be cleaved, but if it does cleaved, then it dies. Traditionally, what we'd have to do is add in an antibiotic resistant gene onto here, uh, put it in there, once we noticed that it was uh, antibiotic resistant, then we could go through and cut out that gene uh, and basically repair it. Problem is, when you do that, you leave scars on the genome. So this way, we're not, this is a no scar uh, process being able to insert genes into that uh, chromosome. When we did this, we got some production values of about 59.6 picomoles per hour. Not quite as fast. Um, of course, it's in the genome, or it's in the genome itself, and so not in the plasmid, but it has a lot of copy numbers. So we need to be able to either increase the number of copy numbers, so if you increase the uh, expression rate of this, or we need to come up with other ways to be more efficient at producing the size of beauty. So this is where um, what James has been doing is uh, we actually got a chance through the cases funding is send up our engineered E. coli onto the International Space Station. Uh, and we went through, we grew it up on glucose as well as wastewater. So we uh, test differences in there. And what James is currently working on is looking at the transcriptomics, the differences in expression between a ground and at uh, in space. In space, they're usually a little bit faster, they're not diffusion limited in there. Um, and so by figuring out how it actually moves through the pathways faster, we should be able to go back and re-engineer and make our production values even faster. I'm not going to get into too much into that because James is going to be defending next semester and I'll let you him tell you all about the uh, um, transcriptomics in there. Um, I will say that uh, working with NASA and the astronauts has been great. Um, 
they did make a little mistake. We were going to run through this for 30 days, and they basically we sent up bags full of these. Said at day one, you're going to take this out of the incubator. At day three, you're going to take this out of the incubator. Well, the astronaut he took put everything in the incubator. At day one, took everything out of the incubator. At day three, went oops. Um, so we had to do some other ground control uh, uh, stuff to see what kind of effect that's going to have. They did put that back into the incubator, and we do now have that back uh, in the lab. Uh, but it was really nice because I got a phone call from space. Uh, he apologized. Um, <laughs> letting it fall flat, though. <laughs> the other thing uh, that we can do to really improve um, this isobutene production, this is a figure um, that I know you can't read, uh, but Tyler Fox, who was an undergrad in my lab, uh, went through and built a hidden Markov model of the known uh, M3K genes that we have, and then went through and searched the NCBI database for more of these particular genes, and he found a whole bunch of these. A lot of these are not even annotated, they're just in there as putative genes. And so going through and actually sorting through, maybe some of these are faster than some of the other ones that we are actually using. Um, so we can actually start putting those in there. And a lot of those, I should have mentioned, are actually coming from thermophiles as well. One of the last things here, okay. um, I'll go through this kind of quickly, uh, is this micro-mineral interactions where um, it's kind of like microbes, they're going to have to try to dissolve some of these minerals to be able to get to your jelly donut. So if you had on a jelly donut, you had to go out and crack open the rock to be able to eat it. Well, a lot of the nutrients and stuff are actually in the mineral form. So they have evolved ways of doing either producing acids, chelators, or even direct electron transfer to be able to uh, break open these minerals get to the nutrients, which then allows them to grow more. Well, humans need minerals as well, particularly rare earth elements. Um, everybody has a phone, right? There's a rare earth element in your phone. There's a rare earth element in uh, your computers. Any electronic, <coughs> almost every battery, has to have some sort of one of these rare earth uh, elements. Uh, even lights are used in there. They're critical in the healthcare and the defense industries. Fortunately, right now, 98% of these rare earths come from China, which kind of makes it for uh, their this potential supply um, loss in there. Uh, and actually, this actually happened about eight years ago, where China decided to reduce its exports and jacked up the prices, and so everything, all of the prices for rare earths, uh, went skyrocketed, um, and now the prices have come down a little bit, but everything is coming from China. We don't have any uh, mine in America that's getting rare earths right now. And actually, the world comes from China. There's some that come from uh, some other places, but most of it comes from China. Well, Alaska has a lot of coal, actually more coal than the entire lower 48. Um, there's two main areas, the Healy and Wishbone, that has some of this coal. Uh, some of my collaborators in uh, Fairbanks went through and measured the amount of rare earths in these, and it's actually quite high at 600 parts per million, and a lot of these are absorbed onto either as a mineral or absorbed onto the clay. The problem is 600 parts per million isn't quite high enough to be economical to um, extract. You still have to go through and do a lot of grinding. Uh, you have to use a lot of acids to try to evolve this. Um, so there really needs to be a lot more optimization to be able to get to that. That's where I think microbes can actually come into this. Traditionally, biomining, you produce a lot of acid. They use the organisms to uh, oxidate or uh, do pyrite oxidation, produces the acid, which leaches the coal and the iron um, or the metal out of there, which then allows them to extract it. 
course, then you get these acid mine drainages, which is a huge environmental problem. <coughs> so I'm going to start using uh, one of the uh, observations that we've made before is that maybe we don't have to use acid peel to get to these. Maybe we can actually weather material down, but weather it faster than if it was to just be sitting out uh, in the environment. In order to do this, uh, there are these microbes that can breathe iron, or well, at least transfer electrons from, there it goes, transfer electrons from where their carbon source and uh, put it into uh, the iron. We can then go through and reoxidize a clay mineral that has this iron in it to then um, uh, change that iron back into iron 3. And when we do that, we notice that um, it starts off as fairly um, edged. Um, there's a lot of fine great edges on here, um, and it's a lot larger. Well, after we do that a couple cycles, it actually looks like it's being weathered a lot more. So broken down quite a bit more. So what I'm thinking, and this is what uh, a Bill Zito um, uh, fellow started in Asia. She started working this. I now have Michael Martinez who's working on this. Uh, he started off as a delicate student and now has continued on in my lab. And uh, we basically going through and cycling between oxygen, where we add in oxygen, use the microbes in there to reduce that oxygen, and then start using the iron in there. So Shiwanella luminescence, or Pentia tolerance, has the ability to be able to use oxygen or iron. And here are some images of them actually growing on the poles, or actually attaching onto it. And if we go through and do this cycle several times, we can start looking for the actual uh, rare earths in there. So this is a recent project that just started. Um, it's actually the Faculty Initiative Fund, the UNAC Faculty Initiative Fund. We got the funds for that. Um, so we don't have any uh, real data on it yet. But I will show you that we are producing more iron. We're using that iron uh, liberation into the solution as a proxy for that rare earth. Now that we have the funds, we can send that off and actually start looking for the rare earths that are being liberated into the solution as well. Uh, this was comparing the two different organisms. Uh, this only has an N of 2, so um, we do need to do this uh, much more to actually uh, set this up. But uh, the adrenalins actually works a lot better with this particular media, uh, but Shiwanella works a lot better with the minimal media. Uh, that's what it looks like right now. So hopefully, uh, you can see the direct link between geomicrobiology of extreme environments and how we can actually use those for biotechnological applications, such as uh, looking at biological dark matter and the novel enzymes that we can get from there for producing things, uh, other products, uh, isobutene, micro-mineral interactions. I went through that pretty quick because I'm running out of time. But uh, hopefully that makes uh, sense of how we can understand that from looking at the molybdenum environments, how they were getting that, uh, and using that for rare earth extractions. A couple other uh, little projects I'm not going to get into. Uh, this is in collaboration with Pat Tonko and uh, Jake uh, Lazzini. He's going to be my graduate student starting on this, looking at um, lakes that have been dosed with rhodonone uh, to be able to kill off the uh, fish, the pike in there. We're going to look at what is the microbial pathways, if there is any that actually goes through and degrades that rope known. Um, and Pat's going to be looking at the abiotic pathways of that. Uh, my last talk that I gave here, uh, one of my undergraduates, Luke Adams, who's now a um, medical, um, at medical school in Chicago, did a lot of work on the um, mud volcanoes, where there's a lot of carbon dioxide coming up. He actually did some min-ion runs, so we're looking through the uh, genomes of some of these isolates that we got through here. Uh, and it looks like there is some novel ways of that they're being able to capture uh, and assimilate that carbon, which then we can use to build up other compounds. Same with uh, this project with Cody Hahn. Um, 
who's been looking at snow algae. So she's been able to fly up onto the glacier, uh, collect these so, uh, samples, come back and look at where they're distributed, how they're actually getting there. Um, and a lot of these are actually used for a lot of biotechnological applications as well, being able to grab onto that particular carbon. <clears throat> so future work, I plan to continue to go out to these extreme environments uh, to look at the ecology and the adaptations and use those lessons that we've learned from these extreme environments and continue to push on uh, the production levels and uh, of these technological applications and even maybe even expand on the different types of uh, technological applications that we have out there. And with that, I'll take any questions. How do you measure uh, interaction? You're talking about these interactions. How do you measure that? Yeah. Um, more, it's through Pearson correlations. Essentially, if they're found in the same spot over and over, uh, and when one's missing, the other one's missing, we're considering that an interaction. Yeah. Okay, so you're, cons you're comparing different sample sites? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, oh, sorry, another question. But on your uh, graph, you have all these dots with colors. <laughs> um, so each dot, what is that? Uh, an individual? Or it's an individual okay. taxa, yeah. Oh, the taxa, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll follow up on that one. Um, I was curious, you, you mentioned that the interactions uh, the, the diversity of those interactions is uh, much lower in higher temperature waters. And you said you were going to explain it. Oh, point it to us. <laughs> 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 I was starting to run out of time, so I was trying to speed up a bit. Um, so when we looked at, uh, a great example of that is when we got to looking at the Candace Kryptonia, right? Where it was a almost an explicit symbiotic relationship with uh, Archimedes, where they are required to have those um, uh, uh, amino acid cofactors being transferred between the two of them. Um, and so at that level, it looks like instead of just sharing with a whole bunch of people, they're forming very tight uh, connections with uh, one or two other taxa. Um, so that's why I meant by that. And so by looking at that, the genome of the Kryptonia, I think that's kind of showing that as well. Um, I'm interested to your isobuti examples going through with the synthesis. Uh, whether it's ever going to be able to replace uh, crude oil as we're going forward. Because I'm interested in just the numbers that you're throwing up there, how much of that would be required to actually make a meaningful contribution. But I'm more interested, I guess, in the idea that you think that since there are so many other enzymes that are already out there, and that you might be able to use that look for individual enzymes that are actually faster or not, or perhaps combine them since that goes your other experiment was. Mm -hmm. That seems like a, a gigantic task to figure yes. out the kind of conversation. I mean, how are you thinking about attacking that kind of question about how do you sample from that distribution of things that are out there in an efficient way? Uh, the like, actual sampling and finding the enzymes, or yes, the, I mean, the test combine them together. Like the idea is, if the goal is to get just make isobutene in a lot of, them, right. how are you going to go about that given the, the this distribution of many many enzymes uh, of unknown uh, efficiency? Uh, and yeah, well, one of the first things that we need to do that was just kind of first pass yeah. look at it. Um, I think what we can do is start narrowing those down. Um, and start picking out different uh, clusters that would probably be looking uh, more similar to each other and only looking at one of those particular clusters. Um, and so definitely breaking that down so you're not looking at all of them, uh, but kind of picking phylogenetically diverse ones. In that. Um, and then the other thing that uh, um, you know, we were talking earlier, Sajar is actually working in my lab to uh, microfluidic environment to encapsulate single cells. Um, if we can get that to actually start working and where we can engineer uh, within those uh, microcapsules, then we can start pushing through these a lot faster. Yeah. Okay, a few questions. So um, this is fun because I've been listening to James 
stuff. And I was curious, your, the gene that you got to make that ice of your team more efficiently, it came from an extrema file, right? But you're using it in the colon and it is a lensa file. So um, how are you making sure that the protein is folded correctly and working well? I know it's got to work, but um, so that was one question. And the other thing is, instead of making one microbe that has all of these functions, now that you know which microbes are in, these extreme environments, could you actually take a couple of them, like the two that you had that were both uh, in the molybdenum? I'm not saying that we're right here, but the molybdenum story, you know, that work well together to, uh, to produce all the amino acids that they needed. Yeah. Could you, you know, could you find a couple, of, instead of just having one microbe that produces everything you need, to, uh, it may cause you to have like a small lock community with two or three members who can help it? Yeah, um, I'll start with your second question because I remember that one. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so that is something that we've uh, talked about um, and uh, being able to, there is some examples where uh, kind of separating those reactions out into separate entities uh, actually increases it, um, but the, the stability of that system becomes a lot harder to maintain. Um, and so uh, that's something that we might try in the future. Um, I don't think we're really quite there yet to being able to model. Um, what seems to happen is if they are in separate systems, that works best is if it needs a separate type of environment. So like nitrogen fixation needs to be under anoxic conditions. Um, and so separating that out uh, for something that needs oxygen conditions. Um, um, what was your first question? The first question was you're taking an extremophile gene and using it in mesophile, so how are you making sure that it's uh, um, behaving correctly and efficiently? Yeah. Um, so we did go through and code on optimize it for E. coli. Um, so it should be uh, expressed uh, because of that. We haven't actually gone through and done the um, proteomics on it to look at what the protein is in there. Um, the only thing we can say is that it's producing more than uh, if it doesn't have it in there. Um, so yeah, there's definitely optimization that we can go through there. And but honestly, we don't really know some of that. Some of the things that I really want to do is start getting into the bioinformatics of modeling the structure of those two enzymes, and maybe even trying to mix them together. Um, there is some side reactions that happen as well. Uh, so if we can figure out how those side reactions are involved in that and get rid of those other side chains in there, um, that might make it even more efficient. <coughs> well, thank you. There is. Um, Food over in 108 and pop. Um, 105A, yes, right over here. Uh, I hope to see everybody over there. You can ask me any questions over there as well. Thank you.